Now turn to part one. Part one. Listen to the conversation between a doctor's secretary and Mr. Jones, who wants to make an appointment with the doctor. Now look at questions one to five on the form. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Dr. Ritter's office. Can I help you? Hi. Yes, I'd like to make an appointment to come in for a checkup, please. Okay. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Jones, Peter Jones. And you want a medical examination? That's right. By the way, my name's Rebecca. I'm Dr. Ritter's secretary. Have you seen Dr. Ritter before, Mr. Jones? Actually, no, Rebecca. We've only just moved to Los Angeles two days ago. Great. Welcome to LA, Mr. Jones. Thank you. When would you like to come in? Any time this week would be fine. I don't have to go into office until next Monday. Okay. Let me see. But first, to see how long you'll need, could you tell me why you need the medical? My insurance company needs it, and my companies were in real estate. Medical insurance also wants me to have one. Kind of killing two birds with one stone. Sure is. Insurance companies want a fairly complete examination, so that means you'll have to come in the morning and don't eat or drink anything after midnight the night before. No problem. Let me see. Would nine a.m. Thursday be convenient? Nine a.m. Thursday. No problem. Oh, I forgot. We have a meeting with my children's new headmaster that morning. That's at eleven. Look at questions six to ten. Now listen to more of the conversation between the secretary and Mr. Jones. Then answer questions six to ten. What school is that? Beverly Hills High School. Oh, that's no problem. The whole examination will take about an hour, maybe a bit more, and the school is only two blocks from here—a three-minute walk. So you'll have plenty of time. That's good. So nine a.m. Thursday. You got it. Now, to save time when you get here, I'll ask you a few questions. Fire away. First, what is your personal medical insurance company, Mr. Jones? Blue Cross. Blue Cross. And how old are you? Forty-six today. Happy birthday! Having a big party? Not really. We don't know anybody here yet, except for two neighbours. I think my family planned to take me out to dinner. A secret surprise, hey? Okay, back to Blue Cross. I'm just checking what they need. Let's see: blood pressure, standard blood and urine tests, cholesterol levels, ECG, checking for diabetes, heart disease, the usual things. Do you have a medical condition at the moment, Mr. Jones? None at all. Touchwood, fit as a fiddle. That's great. I'm sure you'll stay that way. And do you know the name of your company's health plan? Yes, I've got it here somewhere. Here it is, the Kaiser Health Insurance Company. Kaiser, yes. They need the same information as Blue Cross. So, as you said, killing two birds with one stone. That's right. And can I have your telephone number, Mr. Jones? Sure. My cell phone is one three eight zero five five six seven two one. One three eight zero five five six seven two one. Right, and my home number is area code eight zero five five two three zero two nine six. Eight zero five five two three zero two nine six. And do you have email? Yes, the address is p jones twelve at hotspot dot com. P jones twelve at hotspot dot com. That's it. Well, that's all I need for now. See you Thursday, Mr. Jones. Sure thing, Rebecca. See you then. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one.
You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a man talking to a group of people about a tour of theatres in the city of Munich in Germany that he has arranged for them. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Right, I've now almost succeeded in finalising plans for our tour, so I'll bring you up to date with what I know. As you know, we're flying first to Munich on Monday the 4th. The flight is at 11.30 so it's too early to have lunch at the airport. I suggest we meet there for coffee at 10, which should give us plenty of time for breakfast before we leave home. When we arrive in Munich, we'll be met at the airport by Klaus Bauer. Klaus works for a tour operator, and he'll look after us for the time we'll be in Germany. He's already liaised with the managers of the theatres we're going to visit, and he's also arranged for an officer of the National Theatre in Munich to show us round the theatre one afternoon during our stay. Now, last time we discussed this trip, I didn't have the precise cost for hotel rooms, but now I have. The normal rate at the hotel where we're staying is 150 euros a night for a double room. I'd hoped to get that down to 120 euros, but in fact I've been able to negotiate a rate of 110. That'll be reflected in the final payment, which you'll need to make by the end of this week. On Tuesday, the day after our arrival, I had hoped we could sit in on a rehearsal at one of the theatres, but unfortunately that's proved very difficult to arrange. So instead we'll have a coach trip to one of the amazing castles in the mountains south of Munich. On Tuesday evening we'll all have dinner together in a restaurant near our hotel. From talking to you all about your preferences, it was clear that a typical local restaurant would be too meat-oriented for some of you. Some of you suggested an Italian restaurant, but I must confess that I decided to book a Lebanese one, as we have plenty of opportunities to go to an Italian restaurant at home. 
On Wednesday afternoon, the director of the play we're going to see that evening will talk to us at the theatre. She'll describe the whole process of producing a play, including how she chose the actors and, as the play we're going to see is a modern one, how she worked with the playwright. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Based on Krakos with Rob's website. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right. Now I'd just like to make a few points about the plays we're going to see. Partly because it might influence your choice of clothes to take with you. The play we're seeing on Wednesday evening is a modern one, and we're going to the premiere so it'll be quite a dressy occasion, though of course you don't have to dress formally. I gather it's rather a multimedia production, with amazing lighting effects and a soundtrack of electronic music, though unfortunately the playwright is ill and is unlikely to be able to attend. On Thursday, we're seeing a play that was first performed last year, when it was commissioned to mark a hundred years since the birth in the town of a well-known scientist. We're going to see a revival of that production, which aroused a lot of interest. Friday's play will really make you think hard about what clothes to pack, as it'll be in the garden of a palace. It's a beautiful setting, but I'd better warn you, there won't be much protection from the wind. On Saturday, we're going by coach to a theatre in another town, not far from Munich. This will be the opening of a drama festival, and the mayor and all the other dignitaries of the town will be attending. After the performance, the mayor is hosting a reception for all the audience and there'll be a band playing traditional music of the region. And after having a day off on Sunday, our final play is on Monday, and it's in the stunning setting of the Old Town Hall, which dates back to the 14th century. The performance marks the 50 years that the lead actor has been on stage, and the play is the one where he made his first professional appearance all those years ago. And the day after that, we'll be flying back home. Now, have you got any questions before I... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a tutor and two students discussing a business case study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully 
and answer questions 21 to 24. Right, Jason and Karen, now I asked you to look at the case study for Box Telecom as part of your exam assessment. It's interesting because they're in the middle of problems at the moment and I want you to track how they deal with them. Um, let's start with you, Karen. Having read through the case study, can you just summarise what the problems were that Box Telecom had to take on board? Um, yeah. Um, well, of course, what first came to their attention was that despite a new advertising campaign, they were suffering from falling sales, and this is something that had many causes. On top of that immediate problem, what had also happened over the last two years was that although they had invested in an expansion plan, they had to face up to increased competition. And before they had a chance to get to grips with the effects of that, they were stalled by a strike. And it was just when they were thinking about making a colossal investment in new machinery for their plants. So they were really in trouble. Yes, I think that's fair. And, Jason, um, now you contacted the company, didn't you? Oh. What did the company define as the reasons for these problems? Well, I think they've hit on the right things. It would be easy to say they had invested too heavily or at the wrong time, but in fact the signs were good, and what they were set back by was high interest rates. At the same time, their longer term problems, which were affecting their market share, were eventually credited to poor training. And having looked at the details in their last report, I think that's right. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So, on to the larger issues then. Karen, what do you think the company will do? Oh, well, obviously they have the choice of accepting the very favourable terms that another company, KMG PLC, have given them to buy them out. That would mean creating a new company with a new image. Or they could decide on a bolder move and offer some new shares if they wanted. But I think they're much more cautious than that and expect they will start trying to find individuals who'd be prepared to back them with some of the capital they need. Well, you mustn't always assume that dramatic problems require dramatic solutions. <laughs> Sometimes there's a simple fix, such as changing the guy at the top. If they truly are cautious then I suspect they will seek to shut down some of their shops. But a more ambitious approach, and one which I think would have more chance of success, would be to alter how they're running things, the management layers and the processes. So, in your analysis, try to think of all the options. Jason? Yes, it's interesting because I found it a really useful company to study. Its problems cross all types of industries, and it's lucky it's so big. A smaller or even medium-sized company would have gone under by now. Ah, well, in fact, what I want you two to do is to go away when we've finished our discussion today and write a report. We've looked in general at the telecommunications market in the UK over the last few sessions, and I want you to take Box Telecom as an example and suggest some ways in which they might overcome their problems and outline the reasons why you think as you do. But try and keep it intrinsic to the company rather than dragging in other examples. Is that OK, Karen? Yes, I think I can do that. Personally, I've got great hopes for it. I think it will recover. That advertising campaign they did was very strong, and they're very innovative with their products. They set new trends. The company's got to recover, don't you think, Jason? Mm, I'm not sure. I think it can, but it's not a foregone conclusion, unless they manage to attract the right level of investment. The company definitely needs a boost, and to attract more highly skilled workers if their recovery is to be long-lasting. When I was talking to the marketing manager, 
He said to me that he thinks the company had got a great management team. But he would say that, wouldn't he? <laughs> but they are suffering from having to work with outdated production machinery, and that could cost a lot to put right. Well, personally, I think the stock market is to blame. I think they were expecting too much of the company, and then inevitably it looked bad when it didn't perform. The market should have had more realistic expectations. And I disagree with you about the advertising campaign, Karen. That's where they could do with some innovation to get sales kick-started. Anyway, let's see what you come up with. with those. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a woman talking to a group of first-year science undergraduates about the developing science of nanotechnology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to look at an important area of science, namely nanotechnology. So, what is it? Nano means tiny, so it's science and engineering on the scale of atoms and molecules. The idea is that by controlling and rearranging atoms, you can literally create anything. However, as we'll see, the science of the small has some big implications, affecting us in many ways. There's no doubt that nanotechnology promises so much for civilization. However, all new technologies have their teething problems. And with nanotechnology, society often gets the wrong idea about its capabilities. Numerous science fiction books and movies have raised people's fears about nanotechnology, with scenarios such as inserting little nanorobots into your body that monitor everything you do without you realising it, or self-replicating nanorobots that eventually take over the world. So. How do we safeguard such a potentially powerful technology? Some scientists recommend that nanoparticles be treated as new chemicals, with separate safety tests and clear labelling. They believe that greater care should also be taken with nanoparticles in laboratories and factories. Others have called for a withdrawal of new nanoproducts, such as cosmetics, and a temporary halt to many kinds of nanotech research. But as far as I'm concerned, there's a need to plough ahead with the discoveries and applications of nanotechnology. I really believe that most scientists would welcome a way to guard against ethical uses of such technology. We can't go around thinking that all innovation is bad, all advancement is bad. As with the debate about any new technology, it is how you use it that's important. So, let's look at some of its possible uses.
Thanks to nanotechnology, there could be a major breakthrough in the field of transportation, with the production of more durable metals. These could be virtually unbreakable, lighter and much more pliable, leading to planes that are 50 times lighter than at present. Those same improved capabilities will dramatically reduce the cost of travelling into space, making it more accessible to ordinary people and opening up a totally new holiday destination. In terms of technology, the computer industry will be able to shrink computer parts down to minute sizes. We need nanotechnology in order to create a new generation of computers that will work even faster and will have a million times more memory, but will be about the size of a sugar cube. Nanotechnology could also revolutionise the way that we generate power. The cost of solar cells will be drastically reduced, so harnessing this energy will be far more economical than at present. But nanotechnology has much wider applications than this and could have an enormous impact on our environment. For instance, tiny airborne nanorobots could be programmed to actually rebuild the ozone layer which could lessen the impact of global warming on our planet. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing thought, isn't it? On a more local scale, this new technology could help with the clean-up of environmental disasters, as nanotechnology will allow us to remove oil and other contaminants from the water far more effectively. And if nanotechnology progresses as expected, as a sort of building block set of about 90 atoms, then you could build anything you wanted from the bottom up. In terms of production, this means that you only use what you need, and so there wouldn't be any waste. The notion that you could create anything at all has major implications for our health. It means that we'll eventually be able to replicate anything. This would have a phenomenal effect on our society. In time, it could even lead to the eradication of famine through the introduction of machines that produce food to feed the hungry. But it's in the area of medicine that nanotechnology may have its biggest impact. How we detect disease will change as tiny biosensors are developed to analyse tests in minutes rather than days. There's even speculation nanorobots could be used to slow the ageing process, lengthening life expectancy. As you can see, I'm very excited by the implications that could be available to us in the next few decades. Just how long it'll take, I honestly don't know. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.